Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Another roller coaster week in the life of Tottenham Hotspur. We've got plenty to talk about today. I'm going to very, very lightly touch on the match last weekend because obviously with it being a Saturday game, we're five days off from it now uh, or even later if you're only just watching this um, a few days after it's been uh, recorded. So I'm not going to go too long on it. And I know I say that sometimes and I'll go on for 20 minutes or so, but I'm not. It's It's barely worth it. It was such a... Poor performance overall, uh, too many players having an off day and it just it doesn't really merit too much discussion. But I'll touch on some little tiny points to begin with. First off, obviously the defending. Um, Eric Dyer and Sergio Regulon obviously had games to forget. Um, Dyer in particular, he's someone that obviously I always have given the benefit of the doubt to as I try to do with every player. Um, but, you know, and especially having come out recently and said there was a bit of an unfair narrative around his performances, I think he'd struggle to say that after Saturday's match. He had a stinker. Um, there's no, you know, beating around the bush. He had a bad game individually. You know, technically there were... He's involved in all three Leeds goals. Um, just wasn't his day at all. And, yeah... You know, there's no need to go over it too much. I think, unfortunately, it was just a day where nothing really particularly went right for him. And I think, you know, he's not going to have really much case for his defence, uh, for the defence, as it were. Uh, Regulon. Regulon, for me, has had a bit of an iffy time since he came back from that injury. I don't know why that is exactly. Um, there may be something else to it, but... His defending, I'd say, and probably attacking, just hasn't been up to levels. People saying, you know, I've seen some people since saying, oh, you know, he's just an attacking fullback, he can't defend. It's not the case. He was very good defensive fullback for Sevilla uh, when he was on loan. And also, when he first came to Spurs, first few months, his defending was excellent. I think just something, whether it's a confidence thing, whether it's an injury that hasn't quite settled, it just isn't quite happening for him at the moment. But I still think he's going to be a, a very good player. And if anything, you know... One of the few positive sides to it, perhaps it means that Real Madrid don't come in this summer of the buyback clause. Um, I'd say it's probably unlikely they will, but you never know how things work. But yeah, those two had a bit of a stinker. Um, and you know, it's it's quite interesting. You look at the defence and you look at another three goals conceded against a team. I think they're in the bottom half still. I'm pretty sure they are in the bottom half still. Um, you know, I've said this before, this isn't new news for you, but... Tottenham are looking to bring in at least one, potentially two centre-backs this summer. They have to sell players to do that. So we're going to see, well, they would hope one or maybe two of the current centre-backs go. Um, you know, it's, again, it's that age-old thing of we can always say as we play our FIFA and we play our football manager and stuff like that, oh, sell this guy, sell this guy. It's easy, simple, get it done doesn't work like that in the real world. Obviously, you have to get an offer for them. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some hope now that Jose Mourinho are going to Roma. Perhaps he'll he'll want to take a couple of uh, centre-backs with him. I personally said it's probably unlikely, um, having complained constantly about his defence. or not, not directly, but you know the indirect stuff he said. Um, I'd be surprised if any of them went with him. I've seen Eric Dyer linked with Roma. Would he be better adapted to Italian football? Maybe, but, you know, I'd be surprised at that. I'd be surprised if there's much dealing between Mourinho and Spurs um, this summer. But, like I say, I know they're looking for new right... Uh, no, right-backs. They may well be looking for new right-backs as well, but certainly centre-back is the priority. Uh, I know they really like uh, Joe Jim Anderson. Um, is it wacky? I think it's Joe Jim Anderson. Uh, obviously, he had a... You say a good season individually. I think he's had a good season at Fulham. Obviously, Fulham having been relegated, not a good season overall. Um, but he's a player certainly Spurs like. The key ingredient I've said this before is they want a leader in that back line, um, and he provides that. You know, he's been captain for quite a few times for Fulham, and obviously he'll go back to Leon. And I'd imagine there'll be a, a few suitors for his signature. But I'd think Spurs, obviously, if they can get the money to do the deal, would be a strong candidate for him. They've got a good relationship with Leon and. Um, Jean-Michel Orlas, the um, president, I think he's, is he CEO and owner, I think. Um, they've got a good relationship there, and I think he's kind of proved that he could be very good in the Premier League. 
Uh, I know they like Milenkovic as well. I think it's Fiorentina, isn't it? I know he's another one that they've been keeping an eye on. A bit more of a gamble with him in terms of whether he's played in the Premier League or not. You know, he hasn't. We know he hasn't. Um, and again, I've said this before, but I know they like Lewis Dunk, but I think he's probably the least likely out of all those three because he's got a big old contract at Brighton as well. But who knows? But yeah, certainly I think we'll see defensive changes this summer. Um, and we'll see some people move on. Essentially, it's who Tottenham can get money for, and that may lead to some unpopular ones. You know, I think one player who hopefully we'll see more of in the seasons to come is Joe Roden. I think it's been, you know, the likes of him and, say, Tongi and Nibele have probably not had the best of times with Ryan Mason coming in. They haven't really had much of a, if any, chance to feature. Uh, I know Tongi um, played in the Southampton game, wasn't very good, but Joe Roden, you know, he's one of the brighter players, and he's pretty much been bombed out of the squad. Um, so I'm sure there'll be two players who are probably just waiting to this summer, you know, time ticking away, um, and they'll get, you know, get a chance to kind of have a fresh slate again, as it were. But yeah, we'll see defensive changes. One part of the defensive, or the back line, however you want to call it, who was superb, I thought, the weekend was Hugo Lloris. Thought he was excellent again. Another really, really good performance for him. He's kind of had a few in a row recently. And I just feel he was probably the one player that could maybe walk out of that game with his head held high. Um, thought he, he was excellent again. And it kind of proved how it's a big shout to kind of let him go in the summer. I, I, I still don't believe he will go in the summer. Um, I'd still be surprised at that. And I think for Tottenham, it gives them one more year at least to find a top-level replacement. I don't think with the lack of money around this summer, they're going to find someone, the money they'd be willing to spend that would be better than Hugo Lloris. I think he's got another good year in him. And, and you know, as, I, as I'm, you know, I've been told a few times that potentially, you know, they could look to offer him a, a new contract as well, or they'd like to. Um, it's whether he wants to sit down and talk about that or not. So, um, yeah, Lloris definitely stood out. thought he did well. Um... Deli Alley had some bright moments, especially first off, obviously, the assist for Son, very nice goal, and the assist for Kane, which, you know, VAR by a toenail, another one of those decisions. Um, I thought, yeah, I thought Deli was bright. I thought he his kind of influence waned as the game went on, and that's obviously the next step for him is to, to kind of get that level of fitness and consistency again. But he showed little glimpses of what he can do with Gareth Southgate watching as well. Probably likely too late to get into the England team. I mean, I know England are going to be allowed to have three extra players go along uh, this summer. We'll see how Dilly does in the last three games, I guess. Um, big disappointment for me was Gareth Bale. You know, after bigging him up after the last game, yes, I know it was Sheffield United. I did say that a million times during the video. Um, an already relegated team. But I did... I was just really disappointed by his overall contribution. He was very quiet, really didn't make much of an impact at all, didn't try to take the game by the scruff of the neck. He wasn't alone. I thought Harry Kane was very ineffective. Um, it was a weird display from a few players. And I think we've seen that a few times. You know, Kane obviously has been phenomenal this season. And in my mind, should be player of the season in the Premier League. I know he hasn't won the title, but again, if you can finish top of the uh, goals and assists, I think you probably deserve it. But again, he had a very quiet, bit like the final, a bit like the cup final, very, very quiet game. And for me, you know, world-class players, that's what they do. They take games by the scruff of the neck it's when things aren't going their way. And just it was another game where Kane didn't do that. Again, I don't want to slate Kane too much. I really don't because he's been so, so good. Uh, but he has had a couple of games this season where that's happened. And uh, for Bale, it showed the inconsistencies in the performances, which... You know, when it comes to the summer and when they look and they sit down and think, do we take that first option that we've got to have him for another year's loan? You know, on, I think it's roughly between 220, 240 grand a week. You need to know that your top player, your top earner, as it were, is going to be regularly contributing every week. That player that's earning the big bucks has to be doing that. With Bale, he's done some lovely things this season. You know, there's some critics would say maybe a flat track bully and that he scored against teams that he really should be scoring against. Um, but yeah, that's a big decision for them to make. I think you know, could that money be spent better elsewhere, or with a regular run of games, could Bale be phenomenal next season? You know, it's a 32 year old. Um, I think we again saw with him the lack of tracking back, especially for the second goal. He left Aurier utterly exposed. 
Uh, he was up somewhere up. It was almost on the edge of their area, uh, Leeds area. So, yeah, that's a big decision to make. You know, I I personally would love the fans to see Bale playing, but for the money involved, you've got to be confident that that's a good deal. Uh, you know, uh, um, a deal that's kind of um, cost. Uh, like, I forgot the expression, but worthy of paying out the the money. Um, other than that, you know, probably Ryan Mason's slim chance maybe of being in the running for the permanent role was gone, I think, that day. You know, it kind of showed he just maybe isn't ready yet. Um, I think he will be. I think he's going to be a terrific manager. And like I said before, everyone uh, that I've spoken to said his training sessions are superb, but he's a very, very clever young coach. But I just think, you know, hopefully... I'd like to see whoever comes in, take him into their staff and get him more and more experience. He may feel that like Scott Parker did, that he's ready to go off and, and be a manager himself. But I just think it's probably not yet. And I think that match probably proved that. And it kind of put the final nail in the coffin, as it were, of, you know, had he won every game, like I said before, maybe he would have got the fan support and then it could have made him at least a candidate. Um, but yeah, no, it didn't quite work out. And I still feel, I still feel the fitness of the squad isn't there. Um, it's something that I've kind of really have felt a few times this season, especially as gone on. I know they've played a lot of games, but they played a lot of games in peak potch years, and we know how he drilled them fitness wise. And towards the end of the season, they were still coming coming on strong at the end of games. You know, even in the season where you know the last full season where you could see it was going a bit wrong. Even in that Ajax game, you know, the, the the fitness they had over Ajax to do that. And I just don't feel we're seeing that. Um, and it'd be interesting to know if it will come out in the wash why that is. But certainly the overall levels of the fitness of the team just don't look to be there. They don't look like a team that in the final minutes are going to rescue games, um, which isn't really like Tottenham in recent seasons. So, so yeah. That's that game. There you go. 11 minutes and almost 12 minutes. Let's get that out of the way. Um, I think I spoke about 20 minutes last week after saying I wouldn't speak too much about it. It, was, it wasn't it was great. It's nothing you can polish to make that look like a good game because it certainly wasn't. So let's get into the nitty gritty of what's going to happen this week in terms of the club and the trust and everything like that. Um, if you've been living on the moon or under a rock, uh, you might have missed the fact that Spurs have been in a bit of a mess recently. They got themselves involved in the European Super League, which was an utter farce and a fiasco. Um, they, yeah, they haven't really shone brightly as a shining light, a beacon for all things good in football. Um, among the other clubs, you know, they're certainly one of those. And I think what did Spurs a real, even further harm was the fact that other clubs came out and apologised straight away. Tottenham didn't. They came out with a really wishy-washy... We re it's almost, I've said it before, you know, we regret that you were offended. Ooh, boo-hoo kind of thing. It wasn't like a we're really sorry type thing. And obviously that led to then the Tottenham Hotspur Supporters Trust having a very strong kind of statement about how they wanted the uh, executive board to resign. I think the executive board, if I'm not mistaken, comprises Daniel Levy... Uh, Donny Marie Cullen and Matthew Collicott, the finance officer. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else. I don't think Todd Klein, the new chap, has come in. I don't know whether he's on that board or not. I'll, I'll look into that and find out. But essentially, I know those three are on it. Um, it was a very strong stance. On, in my personal opinion, I understood it and I understood the logic behind it because I think the trust, especially having dealt with Spurs constantly, you know, I think they meet them, I think maybe every other month, possibly every month, but regularly, maybe slightly less than that, to be honest. But they meet with them regularly and, um, you know, at no point was the Super League mentioned. And to be fair, as someone that's seen the minutes of all of these meetings that have taken place, um, obviously you have to report on them. They were asked about it. Spurs were asked constantly about joining such a league and they kept denying it and saying, no, we're not. So obviously that would is a breach of trust um, for the trust. And I understand why they went in strong. My only thing I'd say is that by going in so strong, it almost left no wiggle room to then discuss stuff, if you see what I mean. You know, there's much more to this, and this is a very simplistic view coming from me. Um, the trust, I think, are fantastic. Uh, they represent, I think it's over 22,000 Tottenham Hotspur fans. I know 
many of those have brilliant people in that trust board. A lot of them, uh, maybe all of them. I just, certainly I don't know all of them, but I certainly know some of the leading figures in the trust, and they are very good people. They fans for decades upon decades upon decades. Um, they are not in it to get any kind of perks or fame or whatever you want to I've seen some people kind of uh, criticize them of they are in it to try and get the best for Tottenham Hotspur they're good people and they seriously want to do the best for the fans um and they've they work very hard I was going to almost swear there they are volunteers that work incredibly hard they really do uh and I felt I think the big thing to take away from this is what the trust has done is that they've been listened to whether it's a mess and whether there's still lots of relationships to fix, ultimately, by going in so strong, they've been listened to, which we'll come to. Because, if you again, if you've missed it completely, Spurs came out with a, a new statement yesterday. And it shows that what the trust has done has had an effect. And that's the key thing. That's what a trust needs to do. And they've done that very well. Like I say, my only slight um, feeling on it is that I kind of felt that by going in so strong and saying you must all resign uh let's talk about this I get why they did it and like I say I think it's led to where we are now which is a good thing but I kind of felt that I could then see it from a Spurs point of view of why would we want to meet you to discuss our resignation do you see what I mean it's it then it creates a very difficult starting place it's kind of like Showing all your cards, I guess, is the kind of the uh, the card expression of it all. And I kind of felt that at that point, relationships were always going to be very difficult because where do you go from there? You know, I understand that, you know, I think it was Daniel Levy offered to meet them, but obviously not on the terms of, hey, we're discussing my resignation or, or the board's resignation. And I can kind of see that from that point of view. Again, everyone that wants Enoch out, don't worry, we're going to talk about that in a bit as well. This is kind of slightly separate to that. It's It kind of left not a lot of room for a manoeuvre. And I think it's quite telling um, that in the trust response, which again I'm going to come to in a little bit, the mentions of resignations and stuff like that have gone from it. And I think that's quite important because I think both sides needed to show a little bit of compromise because that's pretty much how negotiations and stuff like this always work. And I think both sides have, by what I can see, from certainly from what the statements say. Um, so where we're at now if you missed the statement from Tottenham, is that rather belatedly they have apologised. Um, they've kind of apologised for elements of it, but what I would say, it is an apology. It is. It should have come a lot sooner. It really should have come a lot sooner. But there is definitely, um, yeah, you know, that they've, they've spoken about kind of uh, apologies for not challenging. I think there's an element to it that's a little bit, I mean, let me get criticism straight out of the way, out, off my chest. I felt personally it should have been an open letter from Daniel Levy. And I was under an impression that it maybe was going to be. Uh, again, I don't know that for sure. But for me, that would have made more sense. It's more humanising. It's more personal. And I think what we ended up with was very much a statement from the company kind of thing. You know, it's very much a cold, faceless statement. And I don't think that did any favours. Uh, to it whatsoever um, and yeah and I think some of the Super League stuff in it is a little bit like we didn't know that it's almost you could read it as if we didn't know the Super League was going to be a Super League you could have told us and I just yeah it, that didn't work for me it was almost like we didn't realise it was going to be something that was going to be set up so quickly it's like it's not signing up for just random stuff. You know, you know what you're signing on a dotted line, especially someone like Daniel Levy. You know what you're signing up for. So all of that was very wishy-washy. But like I say, it had an apology. It apology. Uh, apologize. I want to get this right for not challenging the annual access system. So what that is is the thing that everyone was pretty much well. One of the things that everyone was annoyed at the fact that there's no promotion relegation and you know the founding clubs were all wasting it and that was it. Um, so yeah yes that should have been challenged yes that, that's probably just the tip of the iceberg of the things that should have been challenged about what's gone wrong um, and it's it's costly for Spurs you know UEFA have have uh, they've been probably lean, more lenient than they maybe might have been had the clubs not stepped out of it you know there's 
donations to be paid. They're going to go to grassroots and stuff like that across the whole. I'm trying to think, I think there's maybe it was 15 million across the nine clubs, I think. Um, and then there's also, I may have this wrong, but I think it was 5% of their earnings from the next season of European football, I think, have to also be donated. So Spurs are lost money, you know, and who knows what comes next with the whole legal element of the Super League itself and trying to get themselves out of it. Um, Spurs also said that the legal process itself uh, prevented them from consulting fans, and that's something they really apologise for, getting themselves into that situation, because, you know, the fans should always have a say on stuff like that. They should... Look, if I'm going to be in the cold light of day, if I'm going to look at it from Tottenham's point of view, they're probably thinking, oh my God, everyone else is going to go away in this Super League. We're going to get left behind and all the fans are going to abs absolutely go at us. Um, for Sorry, you can probably hear our doorbell there. It's probably not Daniel Levy knocking on my door to tell me um, everything that's gone wrong. Uh, the dog's getting very annoyed at the whole thing, even mention the Super League and the, my dog gets very upset about it. It's, it's a very sore subject. Um, but yeah, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> my dog's made me lose my train of thought. Of course he has. But uh, oh yeah, sorry, I know what I'm saying. The, the, um, in itself, you kind of look at it and you think, we don't want to get left behind. Our fans will probably turn on us in the future because we weren't part of this huge enormous cash generating big clubs thing and we weren't showing our ambition that's one side of it of course the other side of it is the money you can't escape the big old what a cash on offer and that will be part of the thinking behind it there's no escaping it of course it's about money um but then you know it was so doomed to fail it really was it was just such a mess of a thing um, and it's just no shock it fell apart, was it, within 48 hours of it kind of all being confirmed? Uh, yeah, it, it really wasn't good at all. But but we've come out the other side, and maybe Tottenham Hotspur will be better for it because, like I say, I think the strength of what the Trust came out with um, and the desire for fan involvement in decisions, while I always thought it was going to be quite difficult with a private company, you know, essentially, why should we let you in to help? Uh, make decisions it kind of has got somewhere whether different people will have different views on the uh, levels of what has changed in a nutshell again if you're not aware <clears throat> the club are going to al allow that's the wrong word and a, a club advisory panel is going to be set up with elected representatives from across Tottenham Hotspur supporters di uh, showing diver a range of diversity um, and presumably from kind of all corners of Tottenham fandom. That will be uh, the criteria for who gets selected for that will be set up by an independent panel. It's not going to be done by Spurs. Um, and that panel will then contain Spurs fans. Now, that panel will have... Um, i trying to think of the exact word. A chair. This is such a, yeah, chair is probably the best word. The chair of that panel, uh, who will be elected... I'm not sure, obviously we don't know the criteria yet, whether they will get elected again by fans in general or they'll get elected by that uh, that panel of fans. But that chair will then become a non-executive director of Tottenham Hotspur, which means I'm told that in they will have full voting rights for everything put to the board, um, and that will include football matters as well. So that in itself is quite a big thing because... Other clubs have started to discuss fan involvement. Uh, from what I understand, and I don't know too much of the in and outs of what's happening at Chelsea, but from what I'm, I understand from uh, one of our Chelsea reporters that I know is that Chelsea have um, said they're going to involve fans, but essentially it's kind of like a watching brief. They'll be able to see what's going on. Whereas for Tottenham, they've actually given, or they're going to give this person full voting rights. You know, of course you could say, well, if the board has so many members and this is one vote, what good is that going to do? Of course, but it is allowing a fan to be involved in decision making. Um, we're going to have to see how it plays out. We'll have to see the legality of that. I don't even know. I, my, my kind of understanding of companies and business and how that works, I don't understand entirely. Um, it's something that I'm going to look in the more and more we get details of the actual criteria and how it works. But it's a step in the right direction. I think that's the biggest thing. And... You know, 
I saw the the trust response to. Uh, sorry, one other thing I didn't like about Tottenham's statement was it digging out the trust. I didn't think that was necessary. I thought maybe I can understand defending yourselves in terms of maybe the fact that you were called to resign, maybe. But to dig out the trust, who obviously are such hardworking volunteers, that didn't really sit right with me. The trust response was good. Like I say, it stepped back slightly. <clears throat> it took away the resignation element, which I think was something that was was always going to cause an issue in just sitting down around a table and getting things thrashed out. Um, I did think, if I'm going to criticise the club statement, I thought one element of the trust response I kind of felt to me, felt like going off in the wrong direction was I think there was one bit where Spurs in their one said, you know, we feel, you know, it's a bit unfair uh, that these are board members who have had the best, uh, or have, I'm trying to think of the exact expression. I might have written it down here so I can get it right. Um, oh, I've got it here. So I lived and breathed the club for two decades. Uh, that was what they said. I kind of felt the trust statement maybe slightly mistook that, and they kind of went down this this avenue of saying they're saying we're not. Um, and I don't know whether that was. I know it took them a few a fair few hours. It didn't come till the next morning. The trust response, so they did really think about it. But just for me, I just feel they maybe slightly took that in the wrong direction. I don't think, uh, and this is only me thinking from the outside. I don't think you could look at the trust and say, well, you haven't been in, you know, part of. Uh, you know, uh, what was it, lived and breathed the club for two decades. I, I know uh, a lot of these trust members, they've lived and breathed the club for way more than two decades. You know, you're talking 30, 40, in some of the cases, even longer than that, 50, 60 years maybe. Um, yeah, I kind of felt for me that, you know, I could be wrong. And I could be that the club were trying to kind of make that out. But I... I, I I didn't take that from the statement. Of all the things that I didn't like about the statement, I didn't feel that was one of the things. And for me, responding to that, it comes this tit-for-tat kind of slanging match, which it now I think, you know, I know the mediators are trying to get things sorted as well. I don't think it's necessary. I think now we're at a stage where both sides kind of showed a little bit of compromise. They can sit down and thrash this out because the key thing for me is that the trust are involved in this panel. I think they have to be. I don't think... I think the worst thing that could come from this, in a way, is... <clears throat> excuse me, too much talking. Is that by passing the trust to do this and trying to... If it, if it, if it is an attempt to weaken the trust position, I don't think does the club any favours in the long term. I don't think it helps this whole process. I think the trust should become part of that. Um, should it have non-trust people? Of course it should. I don't think it, one organisation... I think it's very important that this panel represents a cross-section of Spurs fans. You know, um, I think it should have trust people involved. I think it should have non-trust people involved. It needs to have everyone's voice. Because there's some people that fully are on board with what the trust do, and there's some people that criticise the trust. Um, you know, and I think you probably need a, a, a good old range of voices. I think that's a crucial thing. And some people saying that I should go on it. No, 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 no. As, 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 um, as much as I'm sure Spurs would utterly hate the thought of a journalist being in on all their board meetings. Um, no, this really has to be uh, people not connected in any way with um, really the day-to-day -day kind of elements of Tottenham Hotspur. It needs to be... It is. Uh, that's probably wrong saying. I think it needs to be people that understand what's going on, but I also think it needs to, like I say, a good cross-section of people. Um, and I really hope it gets somewhere now. I really hope it does, because, you know, I think the Trust have done some good stuff in getting this really dragged to the forefront um, and not letting Spurs just kind of slink away and get away with it. Uh, and I think what Spurs have done has shown some compromise, which is massive for Spurs, that, you know... Tottenham Hotspur are a PR nightmare. They make so many silly missteps that, you know, it'd be wonderful if there was someone within the club who just, any time they, well, I was say make a decision, that's what this panel's about, but also when they, sometimes when they come out with their public statements and things, you just, it'd be lovely if there was someone that just went, don't do that. No, 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 don't say that. Uh, just, just, do you really need to put that bit in? Can you not say this in this way? It just... For me, that's something I just feel is crucially missing in a lot of their community. Their communication is pretty awful as a club. It really is. Um, and, 
yeah, I just think that's something that it, it misses. Some of their stuff, I think they engage with the fans really well. But I just think when this is the best example we've had, really, is explaining it. When they have to explain themselves, I don't know. I, I feel they kind of miss more than they hit. Um, and yeah, it'd just be great if there was someone on the inside that could just say, come on, think about it. Know your fan base. Know what they want. Read the room. That's probably the key expression is read the room. Um, I said I was going to touch on it. Obviously, there's another element to it as well. Obviously, is the people that Enoch out, Daniel Levy out, that want him out and all of that. Um, and I completely understand the frustration I've always said from the start. Um, while I think personally, he's done a lot of, Levy and Enoch have done a lot of cool stuff off the pitch. I don't. I think it's a completely unrecognisable club to the one they took over off the pitch. On the pitch, it hasn't been good enough. There's no getting away from that. You know, one trophy in 20 years is abysmal. It's terrible. Uh, I said this before. There's been mistakes made in not backing managers to the full, uh, not just going that extra mile sometimes, and maybe taking a slight gamble with transfers. Um, there's managerial points. I said a million times. I think they've fluked uh, a lot of the well, the three main good ones that they've done. They've been backup options and and things like that. Uh, which is why it's so crucial they get this next one right. Um, but what I would say, what I would say, the caveat I'd say is I understand the frustration and, you know, um, there was a little protest a couple of weeks back that I, before the match, um completely forgot which match it was, maybe Southampton match, I spoke to some of the guys involved uh, and they, I could totally understand a lot of their concerns. The one thing I'd always say, though, is is who next? Um I, I think you need there needs to be a solution to it as well. Um, you know, if you're just saying I want some oligarch or s- state in the Middle East or not Middle East, you know, state some country to come in essentially and buy buy the club, you know, it's you're kind of going into also a bit of a morally, you know, an ethical bit of a dilemma there. You're going into an area of, you know, it it needs to be the right person. It needs to be. Um, you know, we look at what's happening with Arsenal and obviously, um, I've completely forgotten the guy's name, the Spotify owner who's trying to buy Arsenal, you know, their opening bid is 1.8. Um, when you look at Spurs with the stadium and everything, and Spurs are going to be looking for more than that. So you need, straight off the bat, you need someone with the finances to not only come in and bid that, but then also have the finances to put into the club that Spurs want, uh, sorry, Spurs fans want. So there needs to be a what next to it. Um, I think it's... I understand it, but I think it's maybe slightly too simplistic to just say, you out, you out, get out. The club then has to be sold, and it's a long process, and it needs to have someone, the right person. You know, by all means, it. the next person that comes in might absolutely smash it. They may well do, but that person has to have an incredible amount of money in today's world to do that. Um so yeah, so I'm fascinated to see where it goes. My gut feeling, and I've said this many times before, uh, well, a few times before, I think Enoch will eventually sell the club. I don't think you're looking at the next couple of years. Uh, sorry to disappoint those who who don't want them around. I, I, I can't see it, um, and I kind of felt the statement also suggested that slightly as well. That I don't think they're going to move anytime soon. And I think that is, I think if, you know, I think it's some... A huge billionaire, ridiculously rich person came in and said, look, bang, here's your offer. Take it or leave it. Here's what we're going to do. And they, the best interests of the clubs are, were at heart. I think they probably would take it. But uh, is this the time now during a pandemic to sell a club? I think I've said that before. I don't really think it is. Um, and this is the one thing I would say about Daniel Levy. Like I say... On the pitch, a lot of missteps. Off the pitch, during a pandemic, when the club are absolutely stuffed financially, along with many other clubs, and they referred to that. Uh, what did they say? They said something in the thing as well that I wanted to say. Like many other, like many clubs, we will need to recover from the loss of substantial revenues, um, and that's you know, there's no getting around it. Look, we'd all love Joe Lewis, you know. The uh, 80, I can't remember how old he is, mid-80s chap who owns the company that owns the company that owns the company that owns Tottenham. We'd love him to say, oh, do you know what? Go for it, lads. Go wild. Wee! Kind of thing. <laughs> I don't know why he'd make that noise. 
Um, we'd love it, but but we've got to be honest. It's 20 years on now, and that hasn't been the case. That's not how it works. Uh, so he's not going to pump money into the club. Uh, so Tottenham is, is meant to be self-sufficient. That's kind of the way it's always been run. Well, what I would say is during a pandemic... You kind of want a penny pincher at the top. I know it's it's football wise, yeah, it's not going to help. In terms of keeping the club in a position where once the stadium revenues come in, start rolling in, it's keeping them maybe alive when other clubs aren't. Um, you know, with Spurs, it's often pointed to about the fact that. People sometimes mistake most valuable club for richest club. It's not the same thing. Spurs are valuable because they own so much property. Um, you know, the stadium itself, the land around it, the land around the training ground. All of their money is tied up in that. They're, they're not a club that has vast cash reserves to to turn to. You know, and they had to take that massive loan from the, the Bank of England, which still needs to be repaid in full. Um, £175 million, that has to be repaid in full. I'm led to believe... By May 2022, initially I thought it was next month, but having spoken, I actually spoke to the Bank of England's uh, press office the other day and and looked into it a little bit deeper. I think they've got another year, but it has to be paid in full. I think it be can be rolled into another loan, but I think it's still that element of it has to be paid back, and and they're not alone. I think Arsenal have got 120 million. I think the FA have borrowed 175 million. It kind of shows you the level of debt that these clubs. And Spurs obviously are already in huge debt, like seven hundred million or more for the stadium. So, is there one person that maybe, in terms of the overall long term future of the club, to have at the helm during this tough time? Daniel Levy, maybe, maybe. Again, I know that's not going to be a popular opinion, um, and I do think I'd love to see some. I'd love to see him find some money from somewhere. You know, he said in the in the I say he the the statement said uh, the stadium will be a game changer and deliver the revenues for investment in the first team, but it's like it will be. It's not going to be this summer. Um, I've always said they're going to have to sell to buy this summer, but yeah, it's a tough one because I know already that the people that absolutely despise Daniel Levy and Enoch will be saying, "Oh my God, how could you say that?" But I always say I come from this from a slightly different background. My background before covering Spurs was covering um, League Two and non-league football, um, where the biggest issues were going out of business, were dropping down divisions, were not being able to pay players. And so maybe I come in it from a slightly different view and seeing how important it is to have the football club kind of exist to begin with. Um, And... You know, and this is this is going to be a hell of a summer for a lot of clubs. You're not going to see lots of big um, signings. I think you'll see maybe among the top six because of the absolute disgust from the fans and the bad feeling and the huge disconnect. Let's not get away from it. The disconnect between Tottenham Hotspur and their fans is probably bigger than it's been in decades. Um, they're going to have to. I think they're going to have to take some gambles. I think they're going to have to have transfers that kind of excite the fans, but it's about getting that money for them. Um, they're going to have to find it from somewhere. If it can't come from player sales, they're going to have to have to find it somewhere. Again, I, I don't know where from, but they're going to have to. Um, so, yeah, let's see where we go. Let's see what happens next with that. But, again, as a journalist, I'm kind of trained to look at all sides of it, and I completely agree with a lot of the sentiments from from all sides. I think the club of I think they even said it in the statement have learned a hell of a lesson in the recent weeks uh, because they've just kind of been shown you can't just do what you want all the time. You've got to have some accountability for some decisions you make, and and I think this fan panel thing will be a good thing. I'd like to see the trust involved. I'd like to see them get back around the table. I'd like to see the trust having a a part to play because, like I said, these are good people that have. You know, lived and breathed Tottenham for many more than two decades, and they really have uh, got the best interest of the club at heart. That's not to say, you know, I know we often say this about the some of the people at Spurs that you know they're only interested in their wallet and stuff like that. Um, what I would say, and this is always what I've heard from people that have 
don't like Daniel Levy as well. People have, I've been talking about people that dealt with him, and this is that people, even if they don't like him, have always said the same thing. Ultimately, his aim is to try to do the best for Tottenham Hotspur as a club. That's always his first aim. He might make wrong decision. Like I say, on pitch, I think he has. Uh, and I think in terms of transfers, I think they have as well. But I think his ultimate aim, he said it is himself, he's always meant to be the custodian of this football club so he can look after it and pass it on to whoever the next person may be. I do think deep down the guy, his heart is, in his heart is to try and do the best for Tottenham Hotspur that he can do with the means at his disposal. Whether he, you feel he could do more, of course, is another thing. Um, but yeah, like I say, who next? I think that's the key thing. Um, but we'll see. You never know. Someone might step forward like this. What Fiona did with Arsenal. There may be some mega rich Spurs fan that suddenly decides, you know, let's go for it, lads. And then we'll see what happens next. But that's kind of... Uh, <laughs> I was about to go for a scump there. That's all i got to say on that. Um, let's talk about the next manager. Next manager. Um... I understand they're getting there. They're getting there. I think the shortlist has now been drawn up. Like I've said in previous videos, they had a long list, and now I think they're down to a shortlist, and talks are going to be held with various parties. As I've said in the past, I think the, the original aim was to try and get it announced before the end of the season. Whether everything that's happened in recent weeks has slightly um, taken up their um, focus, uh, especially Daniel Levy's, I think that may be the case, and that's that's their own fault. You know, it's, it's no one else's fault. It's the, this is the club's fault. Um, but I still think if it's not done before the end of the season, it will be done pretty soon after the season finishes. You know, maybe, you know, technically, when's the Champions League final? 29th of May. Uh, maybe by the end of May, potentially uh, just into June. But who knows? It could be even sooner. I, I, from everything I'm hearing, it's moving ahead. Uh, and they've got this shortlist and... They're hoping to get, you know, whoever their top candidate may be. It's so difficult for the fans, especially, to kind of get a grip of what's going on. Because from everything I understand, Tottenham are really keeping their cards close to their chest on this one, which is why you're seeing, you know, the betting market is a mere. I'm not a better myself, um, but my goodness, some of the names that have been cropping up, and it's. It's based on very little. It's maybe based on... Because uh, the thing with the betting market, if I'm sure many of you are better versed than me in it, but it's driven by the bets. So say, I don't know, let's use the example this week of Simone um, um, Inzaghi. Simone Inzaghi's name came up. That kind of suddenly got circulated. People were WhatsApping about it. People were coming out with these statements. I've been told that. And it's like... No, you haven't. Everyone got. I get sent these forwarded WhatsApps and things like that, and all of that. Um, and so, someone that, as I'm led to believe, is not even in consideration for Tottenham Hotspur, uh, Simone, uh, Simone and Zaghi, is suddenly up at the top of the betting list, and, and at a stage where almost it's locked the betting, and, and they're not taking any more bets. And that's happened with a few people, and it seems to be an Italian theme to it. I've seen. Uh, who have I seen up there? Inzaghi, uh, Conte, Sarri, Gasparini, uh, Allegri, <clears throat> all of them have spent their time up at the top of that list. And as far as I'm aware, none of them uh, are in consideration for the role. Um, I know they like Allegri, Spurs, uh, but I don't think he quite fits the profile of what they're looking for in their next coach. Yes, I hear you, you shout. What, their profile doesn't include winning trophies? Yes, I know he's a very successful, excellent manager, but I don't think he ticks those boxes of what I've said before in terms of uh, the attacking philosophy, possession-based mentality. I mean, technically, yes, he does on that one to a degree. Um, and someone that's using all the cutting-edge techniques and... Um, I forgot, I mean, even I've forgotten the profile. So I've said it so many times, it's actually gone out of my head. Um, so, yeah. As far as I'm aware, he's not. Conte is kind of a similar vein. And also, Conte is one of the most well-paid managers in the world. I think he's on something like £20 million a, a year. Um, yeah, that's... I think he's a nice idea, Conte. But yeah, as far as I'm aware, those five Italians that I've said, and this is not against Italians, it just so happens that the Italian media have just gone crazy with their Tottenham uh, links. And like I say, and the betting also is influenced by just people randomly saying it's going to be them 
as far as I'm aware, it's not any of those. Uh, not on this shortlist. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I don't think I've ever kind of shied away from the fact that I know the club really like Brendan Rodgers. Um, whether you then, you know, I've said this a million times, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but whether you jump from Leicester to Tottenham right now is is a huge decision to make and, and, and maybe some people would say a bizarre one. Um, I know they like Graham Potter. And I know, I don't know if I said this in the last video or not, that I know some of the Spurs players certainly have been really impressed when they've come up against Brighton um, and wouldn't be ad averse to um, Spurs pursuing Potter. So I know he's got support in the in the camp, as it were. Um, I've seen Scott Parker mentioned a bit. As I've said before, everything I get the impression with Scott Parker is that it's he's one for the future, not for the now. Um, and that, you know... I mean, the guy got relegated uh, last night. It's like you don't bounce a relegated manager straight into um, a position of a team that wants to get Champions League football. It's, yeah, I don't think it's going to be Scott Parker. From everything I hear, it's not going to be Scott Parker. Um, but like I say, they're keeping their cards very close to their chest, which is frustrating for, no doubt, the bookies, the media, and myself. Um, but it does help them operate a bit better. Of course it does, you know. Um, it, it kind of it allows them to maybe uh, yeah just move around trying to have these talks with the people they want you know you'd imagine that will be you know maybe three people on the shortlist maybe four and then as as with anyone you know I've I've been in a position before where I've employed people um, back in the day when I was an editor um, and you know you you see a, a short list of people and, and you talk to them all you may have a preferred candidate in your head. Um, but ultimately, you you listen to all of their views, their ways of working, and what they're going to bring to the role, and then you make your final decision. and And I think Spurs will come to that decision quite quickly. And then it comes down to the nitty gritty of when you can announce these things, you know. And if it is someone that's in a job, does it have to wait till the season has just finished? Uh, does it need to be a little bit more time? Um, we'll see. But yeah, I mean, Poch. I can't really go without saying Poch. Uh, Poch is a tough one. I really feel for him. I think he's gone into a club, which I always said this about PSG and Real Madrid. They're not really clubs that are massively conducive to the way Poch works. He wants to create this family like we spoke about before, and he wants to build something from the ground up. That's kind of his way of doing it. And that's you're not going to get a lot of time to do that in clubs like that. And, and you know, he's come in with no preseason to do his, like I said before, the incredible fitness preseason type stuff he does. Um, and yeah, by all means, he may, you know, PSG may dramatically get rid of him after just uh, whatever it is. Did he come in November? I'm trying to think what it was. He joined not long, anyway. Um, if that, maybe after that. But yeah, I think it was after that, wasn't it? He hasn't been there that long at all. Um, if they were to do that, which they probably, they'd maybe be mad to do. But I, as far as I'm understand no kind of spurs and potch and all that I haven't had any chats about potentially coming back I, I think it's probably too soon you know especially if he's sacked you don't want to bounce straight back into your last job just because it's comfortable um i think he probably needs to put a little bit more distance between him and tottenham for a few years as he said himself i think he will come back one day but you know just coming back less than two years later all the same problems are still going to be there i don't think Whatever is promised, it's it's going to be the same job. Um, and I think he needs to go away and get more experience of other clubs and hopefully win himself some more trophies to add to the, the French League Cup that he won a couple of months back. Um, but yeah, no, I, 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 can't, I can't see that one myself. It, who knows? Who knows? It could suddenly get sacked and, and Spurs suddenly think, you know what, our ideal profile, it is Pochettino. And he thinks, oh, I just want to come home. I'm sad and all that. I don't know. But... From what I'm told at this moment, I don't think it is going to be Poch. Um, and yes, I know this sounds like it's not him, it's not him, it's not him. But that's kind of the way it works. It's easier to uncover who things aren't in a process like this than the people that is. And like I say, that's because, you know, the people you speak to, and obviously, you know, as journalists, we have so many different sources. We, we have sources within the club. We have sources connected to managers or players and everything. Um, and the kind of common theme is, you know, it's, it's not to 
let's say, for instance, as an example, let's uh, it's not saying this is a source I have, but let's say I know someone connected with a manager. That person is not going to want to jeopardize any talks with their manager or their client um, and potentially push their manager out of the frame if it becomes public. And it's it's kind of the way it works. And it, I, I can understand it frustrates people. And, and I've had I've had this with transfers as well, where people say, like, you're always telling us who it's not. Why aren't you telling us who it is kind of thing? And and the truth is, is especially a club like Tottenham, because of the finances they don't have and the way they like to operate, they like to try and keep everything as hidden as possible until the last possible moment um, to make it easier for them to operate and not get others gazump them and come in and, and, and take away what they're trying to get. Um, and so, you know, I, as soon as I know, I will put that out there. And it may be one of the ones that I've said. It may be one of the, you know, a Rogers or a Potter that, that I've already said that I know this, the club really like. You know, they liked Nagelsmann, but he's gone. Uh, they liked Ten Hag, but that situation's a strange one. Obviously, his deal had another year put on it by Ajax. Whether that's a new, fresh deal or whether that's just an option that's been taken up as another thing, uh, potentially if Spurs still wanted to go for him, you'd think finance-wise it just means it's paying more money. Personally, I just kind of feel the way he spoke after that new deal was announced suggested that, yes, he'd spoken to other clubs or had had some intermediary kind of chat and that you know he was staying at Ajax. It kind of how that felt. Um, again, could be wrong. Spurs might decide he's the guy we wanted all along and they pay out the money. So, you know, in, in this process, we're kind of... We'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. It's the best thing to say. I, I'll keep digging. Of course I will. And as soon as I know, um, I'll let you guys know. And like I say, I don't think it'll be too long before we find out. You know, we're almost at the end of the season now. Three more games and that's it. Um, other thing very tightly, just a bit of house... Uh, other thing just to touch on, a little bit of housekeeping as it were. Spurs put in two uh, planning applications. Um, this got a very weird response from people. Well, that's not weird. I understand it. I do understand the frustration. So Tottenham put in planning applications for a little one single story extension to the side of their academy building. Uh, just to kind of, essentially it's mainly uh, gym stuff, medical facilities, sports science stuff, and also a double story, a two story extension for a new media centre for all of their people that create the content you see on their social media and on their website and stuff like that. People went a bit nuts about that when I put that story out and they're saying, oh my God, the money should be going towards players, blah, blah, blah. I even tried to stress it. I think this is the difficult thing about Twitter sometimes is I stress very clearly in my tweet, this is not about now. This is not even about near future. These are long, long-term things that they eventually hope to build and pay out for. Uh, the money is not there to do them right now. Um, it's something that in the future they want to get the planning permissions in so that they have those planning permissions and and if they lapse then they can get them updated, things like that. Uh, it's just so they can make these alterations. Um, I understand with the current climate and how frustrated people are, they'd latch on that and say, oh no, you know, why aren't they, the money, God, it's a property business, not a club, a football club and all that, and I get that. But I think do feel sometimes people are so ready to come out with a statement, especially with that tweet. I made it really clear that, you know, this is not for any time soon. There's no money being spent out on it right now. Uh, this is for years down the line. Um, I think people almost, maybe they misread it. Maybe they don't read the full element of the tweet. Or maybe there's just, we're ready to have a go. So we're going to, whatever you've said. Um, again, I understand the frustration, but yeah, things for the future. Things of the future. Honestly, any money they've got this summer will go towards trying to get players in because they need changes. They know they need changes. Um, like I've always said, I just hope it doesn't mean a really unpopular player sale. Um, not an unpopular player, an unpopular sale. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that obviously was announced today as well is the NFL games. Um, they're coming back this year. So you've got the uh, Atlanta Falcons will be the home team taking on the New York Jets. And the Jacksonville Jaguars will be the home team taking on the Miami Dolphins. And, I mean, that's significant for two reasons. Again, it got a lot of criticism. Like, I don't care about NFL. Get off my timeline. Read the room. Blah, blah, blah. I understand that. But on the flip side, this is money that comes into the club. This is the way of Spurs getting their revenue stream back, of using the stadium to get the money to put into the first team. 
again, whether people think that will go to the first team. I know people think that it goes into this magic pocket of Enoch. Um, you know, that's not what I'm led to believe, but then, you know. Um, you know, the NFL stuff, it's uh, it's only to certain people's taste. I personally, I do like the NFL, so I think it's pretty cool from that aspect. But I think more than anything it is, it's just getting money back into a club that's been financially crippled. So while I understand the Spurs fans don't want to hear about it and they will hit back at a tweet saying it, you know, it's the kind of thing that officially has to be announced. The NFL UK and their partners in it, whatever, uh, I can't remember the um, expression they use now. They're, um, ah, something. But yeah, all the people, stakeholders, all the stakeholders involved, you know, it has to be announced at all, the same time by all parties. So it just kind of has to. Money-wise, it brings money into the club. It just does. You know, we can't complain on one side that money isn't being spent and then complain about money coming in to be able to be spent. You see what I mean? Um, I get it, though. I get it. I get it. This is the thing. I don't want to be seen as, as this guy that says, no, you're wrong, because that's not what I'm saying at all. I totally understand a lot of the frustration. I really do. I just think it's it's important that we look at things rationally and, we, and anything that is wanted um, has to be rationally thought out and thoughtful. Because like I said, I think that's kind of a really important aspect of what the Trust have done. I think the Trust have gone out there and while... As I say, I think that maybe they went in very, perhaps too strongly to begin with. It has had an effect. It has. And I think the reason it's had an effect is because it was very well thought out, a lot of it. I think they'd really had thought about going forward, what would happen next, and how you make a situation right. I wouldn't say I agree with all of it, as I said, but I do think it was very carefully planned out and thought out. And it's been coordinated with a lot of other trusts and what they're doing with their clubs as well. And I think that's the key for me. I appreciate frustrations and I appreciate people will want Levy out, Enoch out, whatever they want to call it. But I want to see a logical progression of what happens next. Then. And I think that's why the trust have been, have had their success with this. Um, and I think it's the same with, with anyone that wants change. You've got to explain what you want to change to. And I think that's crucial. Um, and that's the biggest thing for me. So, yeah, I mean... The season potters to its conclusion. Uh, I didn't mean to use potters. That sounded like I was slipping in some subliminal. Who's the next manager? Um, just we've got we've got three games left. Wolves obviously at the weekend. Another tough game. They're all tough for Tottenham right now. They need to finish the season with a bit of momentum. Give Tot you know top four. I think by the time you may watch this tonight, Chelsea may have won, and top four could also be mathematically off the table. Let's be honest, it's very unlikely anyway. Uh, but Spurs just need to get a bit of momentum, finish at least in some kind of European qualification spots. It's all very messy at the moment of potentially the Europa Conference League, as it's called, could go down to eighth place um, if European competitions are won by English teams. Obviously, we know the Champions League is going to be, um, and obviously if Chelsea finish the top four as well, and we know... We know United are in the Europa League final against Villarreal and they could finish in the top four, certainly in European places. So no, they are going to finish in the top four. Um, so it could go down to eighth. Whether you want to be in the Conference League is another thing. It's not the sexiest competition and it's bizarre. I just personally think it's not a waste of time. Um, it's a waste of time in terms of does Europe really need a third competition? Does it really have any kind of merit to it? Does it have any... Um, luster to it and shine to it does it really mean anything if you win it kind of thing that's my issue with it personally I prefer Spurs getting at least the Europa League um, and we get to have some European away days that'd be class you know we've missed out on that massively so yeah apologies if there was some kind of uh, not rants in there but maybe reiterating points too much I do do that sometimes but I try and get my point across um, and we're back in action uh, at the weekend at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium Spurs players just need to have a little bit of pride. See out the season. Some of them may want to leave. They want to put performances in that can put them in a shop window. Or there may be players that want to fight for their future and show any incoming manager. Look, have a look at the tapes of the last few games. Look what I can do. Um, and then obviously we've got lone players coming back. Um, I will talk about that in a future video. Some people have asked about that, but I've gone on for a while now. I'm about to hit the hour mark. So I don't want to go into that too much Um to do an article on it, so I have a little look on um, on the website today. Um, but yeah, so there we go. 
Let's see what the next few uh, days and weeks bring. Like I say, I think they're getting there with the manager. And I think we'll find out, um, hopefully, I don't think it's going to drag into the summer, let's put it that way. Um, and hopefully it's a appointment that we could all get behind. And, uh, you know, personally, it, if it were to be someone like a Roberto Martinez, I think that would go down like an absolute lead balloon. I think that would be an absolute shocker. <coughs> Excuse me. See, it's even making me cough just the thought of it. Um, you know, I like both. I think there's a lot of merits to both Rogers and Potter. Um, I do think they also both have the downsides, as any manager does. I think there's gambles to be had there. And like I say, I think there's one more name, at least, that we don't know about that's going to come out of the woodwork, and I'll be intrigued to see who that is. And that may be the person that becomes the manager. Uh, we'll see. But it just needs to be someone to excite us. It needs to be someone that unites the club again, brings the fans back towards the club, you know, Two, three years ago, everyone was such a big, happy family. And it was such a great time to kind of be involved with Spurs, and reporting on Spurs, being a Spurs fan. And I think we need to get back to that. And I think whoever it is needs to have the full backing of Daniel Levy and the board. And they need to just let them crack on and do what they've got to do. Um, because I think that's crucial. Tottenham fans need to be proud of their club again. I think that's the most important thing. They're not right now, but they need to be. Because it's an incredible, grand old club with wonderful traditions um and it deserves to be kind of cherished and and for the fans to be proud of it and hopefully we can all be proud of it again uh in the near future so there you go i'm gonna wrap up there because i've gone over the hour mark apologies if i went on for too long hopefully uh, i know there's some people that really don't like the long videos and there's some people that really like the long videos so i can't please everyone uh, but anyway as always stay safe stay healthy look after yourselves and i shall catch you later goodbye